It said interrupted. So sorry. So since we're interrupted, we just clicked finish and then came back. So I'm sure Facebook is letting people know that we jumped back on. I didn't mean to hang up on you. Sorry. Sorry. It's supposed to say populating. <laughs> Here we go. Facebook is building an audience for us. It's so nice of them. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Facebook. Let's see. I'm wearing my mermaid tail. I see that. There we go. All oh, people are coming back. There we go. Sorry, guys. We got the little... Jennifer Fenton, you're such a rock star. You know just what to do on live videos. Jennifer said, interrupted. I'm like, cool. I wish you guys could see this thing that I'm wearing. Um, I know we were just talking about last names, but hang on. You got to see this. So my friends, my friends know that I love mermaids. So this is a mermaid tail. And... This is the whole mermaid body part. This is the part that's supposed to go up to like wherever the tail stops. I'm wearing a mermaid tail. It's also a blanket. It's made by uh, who? Lucinda Koblenz. <gasps> Raven. All right. She says we and I like swimwear. Okay. People are back. All They're right. back. What was I saying? Uh, we were talking about having the same last name, and I asked same if I was a Kardashian, if you would have oh. became Brad Kardashian. Thank you so much. Um, I really encourage. The woman to take the man's last the name, um, and I do so uh, for the reason that be careful. Be um, careful. When if you're offended, be offended. That's right. When a woman you takes a man's last name, they are starting a new family. Mm. They are separate from their parents. They're starting a new family, and this is how I understand it biblically, is about leaving your leaving your parents and starting a new home. This is a new, I and Extina are a totally new, separate generation of Harmsworths. Now, we still love our families, and we still care about them, but we are something new. A whole different sect. I also had, I remember, uh, I had some really close friends and they talked about how, um, why do you move, why do you never live in your parents' house when you get married? Why biblically do they say, don't live with your parents? And <laughs> it actually is about, the Bible doesn't say, don't live with your parents. It says, don't live with her parents. And, uh... and it's so fascinating. They talked about it. They said that um, because of how we're created and because of the design and because of the leadership roles in a home, um, the truth is when my wife, if I yes, live in my, that. if yes. I live in my parents' yes, basement with my wife, mm. Mm. my dad does not have, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. What? I don't live with his parents. I don't think y'all should live with any of their parents. I don't think you should live with your parents either. But Ever. It's, because it's about, if you live in your parents' home, they have authority over you. And because they have authority over you, they have authority over your spouse. And who's the man? And who's the man? Not my daddy. Not his daddy. Brad I is need the to be, man. I need to be the leader. I can't have... It is bad for my family for there to be another leader stepping in. And two daddies. <laughs> two daddies is bad. All right. Um, so I, But I highly encourage the woman to take the guy's name. That is a... A symbol of submission, and submission uh -huh. is a word that scares a lot of people, but it's not a bad thing, especially in this case. It's not a bad thing. It's a symbol of of her believing me to be a worthy leader, True. which is necessary for a good marriage, that she believe that. Yeah, man. Brad is the dad. <laughs> he hates that. Yeah, <laughs> I used I to have this little white dog. Her name was Ashley. Ashley West, the Westie. Oh, I love that dog. And when I moved, because Brad was allergic to her, the lady who adopted my dog, she used to, when I'd walk in the door, she'd say, Ashley, your mommy's here. And guess what? Daddy Brad is here. And Brad would about have to choke that vomit. He's like, never call me Daddy Brad. <laughs> he doesn't like it. He hates it. Now a whole bunch of people are going to call me that because he told them. Daddy Brad. <laughs> Honey, if we have kids, <laughs> if we have kids, though, I'm going to... Can I tell them to call you Daddy Brad? No. It's so cute. What about Braddy? Reminds it, it rhymes with Daddy. No. Braddy. Um. <laughs> ah. So Stop. funny.
funny. Um, <laughs> all right, so back to. Mm. That's a good question. All right. Let's hit that before. That's a good one. Before we go on. Yeah. So someone just asked, what does submission mean to Extina? I used to freaking hate that word because because I came from a church that like very, very hard groomed people to not question authority and to obey blindly. And it got people into a lot of trouble. Um, that church turned into more of a cult by the time that I left. Um, and so that word submit had me doing the puke response in my throat. Chunks. Bile. Vomit. Submit, really? And so I had to basically sort through, um, does submit mean that you blindly follow a leader without questioning, without having any independent thought on a matter? And I don't believe that that's what it means. Um, now, when I, when I hear the word submit, I no longer think of a doormat. I no longer think of somebody who's getting walked all over. I no longer view it as somebody who um, just blindly, unquestioningly gives their loyalty and trust and gets walked all over and take advantage of. Now when I hear the word submission, I guess I've had to retrain my brain to see it as um, mutual respect, mutual honor, um, and a trust level that my husband is on my team. Because if you fear that the person who has leadership in your life will take advantage of you, um, if you fear that you can't trust them, then submission is going to be a really hard thing. Um, trusting them is going to be a really hard thing. Um, believing in them when they tell you, I don't think that that's in our best interest, um, that's going to be a really hard thing. But what Brad's about to talk about, about being a team, that's been highly helpful, believing that my husband has my back, believing that we are on the same team, um, that makes it easier for me to trust him, to respect his ideas, um, and not to endlessly challenge him or think that we're on opposing teams and that he's he's trying to sabotage me or he's not out for what makes me happy. So uh, that's been a, a trust a trust level that's increased where now I have more honor and respect for my husband's viewpoints because I don't think that he's trying to keep me down or hurt me or abuse me or neglect me or ruin my career. Yeah. Right. We need to, we always, we need to realize both as singles looking for a partner and as married couples that though we are individuals, we can no longer afford to be independent. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, we still are our own people. My goals are a little bit different than hers. My, you know, the th some of the things I enjoy are a little bit different than hers. I encourage, you know, guys to spend guy time with quality men who have what they want. I encourage girls spend quality time with quality women who have what you want. People who support your marriage. Um, but, you know, that proves that I am an individual apart from my wife, mm -hmm. but we can no longer afford to be independent. We are either together or we are not, and not, you can never have in a marriage. That is a bad, dangerous place. Mm -hmm. We always need to be together. Um, we are a team. We are a team. Mm -hmm. We need to always be a team. Yeah, man. You know, you can't in the middle of a hockey game all of a sudden decide, I don't want to be on this team anymore I'm and stop agent. playing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. What happens? Everybody loses. You don't win. If you win, the team wins. If you lose, the team loses. And that's the way life is after you get married. Mm. That's okay. That's good, fun. That's okay. In yeah. fact, it's beautiful. You know, there, I, there's people who talk about all you should ever need is God. I think we were designed to be able to survive and sustain and have a wonderful life, just you and God. But I don't think all we need is God. I think we were designed to have a teammate, Aww. designed to have a partner, designed to be married. There's a few individuals who weren't, and that is their blessing, you know, just like Paul. But otherwise, 
You're not independent anymore. Stop living like it. Which brings us to the next point. What does that mean for your bank accounts? Hang on, hang on. I'm going to walk over in my cool outfit. I'll be right back. I'm walking in my mermaid tail. Okay. okay. What, what does that mean for your bank account? I know couples who have separate bank accounts and they have, they keep separate bank accounts and they've done it for years. And honestly, I think that's really destructive. Like, either you're a team or you're not. Mm -hmm. Right? Either you're trying to maintain your independence or you're trying to be a team. There's no middle ground in there. We share some of our bank accounts. I have a really good solution I'll talk about in a moment for keeping independence with money even though you're a team. But I see too many people hanging on to their, no, these are my bank accounts and these are yours and you'll cover these bills and you'll cover those. Well, I guess if you really twisted it, you could say you were some kind of team, but truthfully, somewhere in your brain, you know you're not. You know, we are, as human beings, we are very, very good at lying to ourselves. <laughs> but the truth is you cannot lie to yourself completely. Whether some piece of your heart or some piece of your mind, it knows, it knows the truth, and it keeps it there. Every time you look at your bank accounts and realize it's not, you're not really a team with your spouse, your brain knows, dang it, they could leave. Mm -hmm. Dang it, maybe they want to one day. Maybe that's why they did this. You know, it might not even be true, but your brain is considering it. Can I talk about that? Yes. Yes, I'll just say one thing before it's Athena does, and that is you need to do everything you can to show your brain and show your heart that you're a team. Don't give yourself any outs. Don't give yourself any ways out. Because if you give yourself a way out, it's like... I think I might read my Bible on Friday morning. I think I might means you're probably not going to. <laughs> as, as opposed to, I'm going to read my Bible on Friday morning, and I'm going to get some accountability so that people know I'm going to read my Bible on Friday morning, and my Bible is going to sit there on the table so it reminds me. You've just set yourself up ah. to get it done. You need to do the same thing with being a team as your spouse. You need to change your dang last name and you need to have the same bank accounts. So good, baby. I love going places and matching her. You get to see. Any of How you know, cute is that? Any of you who go to events with us, you see, I sometimes I wear the same color. If I don't, I compliment her. Often our hair is the same shade. I love that. Why? Because it's a physical reminder to my brain and my heart and everybody watching that we're a team. Same Z's. Don't give yourself any outs and go for it, baby. Same Jersey, baby. Talking. Same Jersey, baby. Uh, I didn't really... I, when Brad and I got married, I was like, what is his obsession with this whole thing? Um, because... <laughs> Jennifer says it's frozen again. Is it frozen for anyone else? I hope not. Let's, we'll have to monitor that. Dun, 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 dun. There's still a lot of people here. Looks like we're, looks like we're okay. Have you ever eaten a blood orange, by the way? These things are freaking phenomenal. So good. So freaking good. I just peeled it and I'm about to talk. Frick. Okay. So when Brad and I got married, I was like, okay, what is um, his obsession with, um, conjoining our bank accounts because I had had a negative experience. Uh, if you've watched previous videos, you know that this is, for Brad and I, this is uh, both our second marriage. Um, we've both been married one time before and this is our second time around. So excited for that. Uh, that is reason and faith over experience and I am just like, pow, let's go for it. Um, so my first marriage these should have been red flags for me. When I got married, I did not want to change my last name. And so I was looking for any possible cop-out. His parents were like, 
what? She, she's not going to take our last name. And I was like, no, I have a career and people know me, uh, in that, in my celebrity makeup artistry career. And I have movie credits with Haas. I'm not changing that. I've already established my name in the career industry or whatever. No baloney. I didn't want his last name because I had hesitations and doubts about him and his family. And so I just said, no, um, and I wasn't married that long. Let me tell you, there's division in that. Um, let me get to, let's go to finances in a second. Um, so with that being the case, then I get married to Brad. And we had to go through the immigration process. And so there was a little gap there, about a year, where I was not supposed to change my last name because we needed to match the immigration papers. But... As soon as the immigration stuff was over, we started making moves for me to change my last name. Now, let me tell you, legally changing your name is not an easy process always. Um, if you have any type of, if, if you have a business, if you have credit cards, if you have debit cards, if you have professional licenses, um, a driver's license, a car, insurance, there's so many different places that once you actually take the initiative and make the time investment. And for me, it was a money investment. I had to go to court. There was a whole lot. It was like a three month process. And then going through and investing my personal time, outsourcing my time to invest it into becoming Mrs. Harmsworth, legally, on paper, getting my new passport, like all that fun stuff. That's an investment. So do you think on a crappy day when I'm just like, who the heck did I marry this guy? Do you think on a really crappy day, if I ever was tempted about it, that I'm just going to be so quick to just go like, I'm just going to freaking get a divorce? Um, no, because I'm going to think about the fact, son of a monkey, I'm going to have to go change my name again. Ugh. And how long it took and how much paperwork and going to court and the money. It was like $300. It was, it was a lot of effort. And that's with most investments in life. When you have made the investment to go to college, when you've made the investment to go to a conference, you have a sudden, uh, a bigger stake in doing something with that and not throwing it in the trash. Uh, so that's first. Second, the commingling of finances. I was like, why, why does he want me to have the same bank account? Um, and again, I had a trust issue from my last marriage. Uh, when I got married the first time around, the person that I married had secret $160,000 of debt, which I didn't know about until like a week or two after we got married. Um, thank you, sweetheart. Uh, so collections, car repos, abandoned apartments, all kinds of stuff that I was like, look, man, I have like good credit. I do not want to stick my name on that thing. Even down to leases, I was scared to put my name on stuff with the guy because I was like, well, what if it gets repoed? Am I going to have like bad credit because I married this guy? And truly, if I was on his team and if I did have his back and if I did believe in him or the validity of the marriage, I would have aggressively gone after that debt with him and fixed it. But I wasn't that invested in it. That tells you a lot about my commitment levels and my fear of commitment back then. Um, so I never commingled my bank accounts with, with him. We didn't have both of our names on the lease. A lot of things that I did to protect myself, um, but it tells you that I didn't have faith in the unity. So uh, fast forward to the end of that marriage, honey, it took all of 90 days, nine zero to dissolve a marriage because we had nothing shared. We didn't have our, we didn't have anything together. We didn't have a car lease together. We didn't have insurance together. We didn't have car insurance together. We didn't have a bank account together. We had no mutual credit cards. We didn't have no mutual squat. And so it was easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl for me to chop deuces and say, bye, I'm out. This is over. 90 days later, the divorce was final. So one of the biggest arguments that Brad and I had recently, yes, we argue, no, we're not perfect, um, was I went to um, like a business conference in Vegas and we were talking about um, restructuring our corporation. So we have a company. Um, when we started the company, Brad was going through the immigration process. So when you're going through immigration, so he's Canadian and he came uh, down to Los Angeles and when we were starting our company, uh, 
he was not supposed to be making money inside the United States. So we didn't want his name on the documents for the company because we didn't want him having a hiccup in immigration um, due to having a corporation formed in America. So when we started our corporation, my name was the name on the company. Now as we're restructuring everything and his citizenship is complete and he's not going anywhere, he's handcuffed to me forever. Uh, now we're going through this process of like restructuring our corporation and putting Brad's name on it. And I think that it was that, um, that final feeling of, okay, we've commingled our bank accounts. We have commingled our insurance. We have commingled everything. And if I had any last doubt in my mind that this was not going to be a forever thing, I remember just sitting there going like, you know what, crap. If 10 years down the road, we have built a billion dollar organization and my husband's name's on it and I find out that he's cheating on me or whatever, think of what it's going to take to get free from that. And it was a big argument because that was what was flying through my head. We're opposite personalities. We had had like a bumpy couple of weeks leading up to me going to that, um, that seminar, that finance seminar. Uh, man, I came home from that. We had some conversations after that. And that was the final thing that we needed to link up together to be solid, to be a team, to be a married couple with commingled finances. But let me tell you what. When you do that, when you choose to commingle the bank accounts, to become one on your finances, you now have 50 hoops to jump through if you do decide on a bad day that, you know, I think I'm going to talk to a divorce lawyer. No, you are going to lose. You're going to lose so much time. You're going to lose so much money. And it's going to be 50 hoops to jump through to get free from this person. Do you know how, how locked in you are now? Do you know how much harder it is to uh, disseminate everything? Do you know how much more um, how much more difficult it's going to be to unravel everything if you take those steps in unity to be one? My first time around, it took 90 days to unravel. There was nothing to unravel. It was so simple. But... Should that crazy harebrained idea ever fly through my mind that I want to get away from him, I will think not once, not twice, but more than a hundred times for all the steps I'm going to have to take to unravel something. Like you don't want to. You mm -hmm. should make it hard to get away from each other. Because your team, you think, you think on a hockey team, guys don't have days where, you know, they don't like some of their teammates. Absolutely they do. But that evening... They have to get on the ice and play as a team. You got to be the same. You got to set up the same way. You got no option but to be a team. Yeah. No option. Hmm. Um, being a team is a lot about a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice every day. Um, because neither of us believe at all that there's only one person out there for everybody. Right. Because if that were true, then the team would be easy. You know, there'd be one person who fits you perfectly. You'd be the perfect team. But the truth is you can be a team with anybody. In fact, in a, in a professional sports team, you don't get to pick who your teammates are. Coach does. Well, isn't that interesting analogy? <laughs> um, That's cool. Your coach picks who your teammates are, and you have to learn to play with them. Just like marriage. Just like babies and kids. good um this orange is so good let's talk about holding each other accountable mm. this is gonna be more to the married couples i think um unless there are specific requests like unless i ask extina can you please keep me accountable to read my bible in the morning you should never be keeping your spouse accountable. You, if your mm -hmm. spouse is about to walk off a cliff, maybe say something. Maybe. <laughs> it might just be a good idea to let them walk off the cliff, experience the consequence, 
so that they'll ask you next time or ask somebody else. But you should never, ever, ever be accountability for your spouse. But first, go to Anderson Advisors and create a living trust <laughs> so that your craft does not go into, what's that thing called? Um, probate. <laughs> probate, that's right. Probate. Don't do so that. I'm going to throw the link for Anderson Advisors in there. But, um... Because the amount of resentment created by a spouse holding a spouse accountable is beyond calculable. That's the kind of thing that creates hate. Like, don't hold your spouse accountable. Let them suffer the consequence if they're going the wrong way. Because they'll figure out to ask somebody else or to ask you. But advice about things like that comes so much better from a friend. A friend because there is this there is this uh, we experience it growing up when our mom asks us to do things too when mom asks you to do something there's this little underlying twist in your head that's like well why does she want me to change it's the exact same twist when your spouse asks you when your spouse keeps you accountable, there's this like, well, what are they gaining by asking me to change? When somebody outside says, maybe, have you thought about this? There's none of that. They don't have anything to gain by asking me to change, by telling me I might be doing something wrong. But me as a spouse, I have tons to gain by saying, hey, babe, have you thought about doing business this way? Or are you reading your Bible? Or, you know, whatever. If I am asking her or keeping her accountable for change, it benefits me. She knows that. Even if she doesn't know it consciously, in her head she knows. Her brain, very clever. very clever. We're talking a lot about clever brains tonight. She knows. Same. If she's like holding me accountable for something, my brain knows she has everything to benefit from it. If he's asking me, did you work out today? I'm going, <clears throat> am I getting chubby? Why is he saying that? <laughs> no, you're not. Um, but if it comes from outside, it means something totally different. Mm -hmm. it, it's something totally different. You're right, Vern. It comes around to trust. But I would be hesitant to assume that my wife trusts me enough. Even, you know, after 40 years, I don't know that I feel safe assuming that she trusts me enough to tell her, for, tell her about things she hasn't specifically asked me to. I don't want him as my accountability partner at all. At all. Do not hold me accountable. I will find someone else. It's like, there's too much room for offense, actually, I think. Like, I want someone who is outside of my situation and is objective. I think that's the difference when you're this close to someone, is that they're not objective. Because they, I don't know, they're too, like, wound in. It's so much easier for someone looking from the outside to be like, oh man, you said you wanted to be over here. You're like, wait, are you a man? Yeah. Would not want to be his accountability partner. Because I don't like making him mad. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, actually, I did. There was one more question we didn't really deal with. But it actually works out here. Um, as a team, we need to be very aware that our teammates aren't perfect. I'm not? You're, you're kidding. You're, it's not safe to answer that question. Um, <laughs> it, our teammates aren't perfect. And yeah. if we, like, when we're dating and looking for a spouse, if we're sitting there waiting, like someone made a comment about, you know, they need to be 100%, 100% uh, cured, basically, of this before they're worthy, you know, and... You never would have got me a shoe. You, you're not going to get anybody if you're waiting for something like that. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is problem. Nobody's free. perfect in any area of their life. Can you put your arm around me, please. Sorry. Mm. Thank you. Um, and we need to realize that we're we're marrying and be aware that we're marrying an imperfect person who's going to make mistakes, whose flaws are going to aggravate us. Never. Never. Like on a team, and that's. One of the reasons we were put in this team is to cover each other, is to accept each other, is to show each other a level of acceptance we never got 
Aww. outside of marriage. That is a joy of mine. Like having a husband that was bullied when he was a kid or felt like he didn't have a safe place. Man, it is a joy in my life to make my husband feel accepted, loved, wanted, and safe. And create that environment in our home, too. That's something that I work towards. Um, and I actually like getting Brad's feedback about that. Uh, I've read this really cool thing. I think it was Lorna Titus, um, who's over the pond. She posted this thing saying, like, ask your spouse, like, what's the top three things that you do to aggravate them? And I was like, okay having very different personalities I don't want to ask this man this because I might really get some some feelings hurt but I did ask between now and my birthday which is a six month gap when I asked him what are the top three things that I could do to make your life heaven on earth and one of the things that he responded with was um, and I mean I work from home my office is at home unless I'm out styling someone uh, I work from home and I have a lot of goals all the time because that's how I'm wired. But my husband asked me, you know, if the house could be clean and if I could have dinner when I come home every day, it would just make me feel like such a rock star and so loved and so wanted and so appreciated. And I'm like, okay, is that challenging for me? Heck yeah. Is there like so many other things that I have going on in my day besides that? Yes. I've actually hired an assistant recently to come and help in our home office. I'm about to hire the second one um, because getting everything work done and the house done is a challenge. Like, I'm not even going to lie. I'm not going to downplay that. It's challenging. Having food ready, grocery shopping, the planning that that takes. Okay, if you are a Sapphire personality, Sapphires have to plan to plan. It's a lot of planning. <laughs> so to make sure that I get all that right uh, and have everything a safe environment for my husband to walk into and experience peace... That is a, a newer goal in my life in the last year, a newer thing on my list. But gosh, is it ever rewarding to know that my husband lived a whole lifetime before me of feeling like he wasn't accepted, loved, appreciated um, in very many spaces except like with his friends. And now I get to see like the look of relaxation on his face and the look of appreciation and the words of appreciation when he tells me like, honey, you're such a good cook. You know, or the relief that I see on his face when, like, I'm like, hey, are you hungry? Food's ready. And he's like, oh, it's so good because I'm starving. What if it hadn't been? What if it was still two hours out and I was still working on a project? Like, stuff like that it is a joy of my life to make him feel loved and safe and wanted and appreciated and calm and at peace and have that environment in our home. So, yeah, it's another goal. It's a huge responsibility, but so worth it. So cool. I don't know why I said that. Mm. And we're back to, what was it, session two, where we talked about love and sacrifice being the same. You know, they're not the same, but going together, they don't, they don't live apart, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Do you have any more questions? No. Oh. What? Uh, <laughs> what? One last point. He's so freaking diligent. One last point we got. After we made these videos, every night he would sit there and go through the messages and go through the questions, anything that got PM'd to both of us. Um, or he would ask me, like, hey, did you get anything in your inbox? Like, he sat there and wrote notes and wrote it down. I'm like, honey, you are so diligent with this. So diligent. I love it. So when he's looking that way, he's looking at his notes. He's so diligent. I just, I, we just love you guys. And, you know, it's not that we know it all or have done everything right, but not if there's at all. any way, anything we've gone through or have been given knowledge of can help, that's what we want to give. We want to pour that out for you guys to take what you want. Mm -hmm. That's really important to us. Um, so, let's talk about one last one. One last thing I got written down, and who knows where things will go from there. But um, if we're a team and we share in the wins and we share in the losses all equally, that means that there's not really anything that goes on that isn't 50%. 
this is a really hard one for a lot of people, but um, if you're dating, you're looking for a spouse, and they struggle with something, let's let's use pornography since that name's come up already tonight. You're dating someone who struggles with pornography. That pornography is their issue. That's theirs. They're responsible to deal with it. They're responsible to to get help. They're responsible to do what it takes to correct that before they marry you. However, as soon as you marry them, it's no longer 100% their issue. You chose to marry them. Oh. Now, as a team, you win or lose together. Ooh. Therefore, you are now 50% responsible for that issue. If it's drugs, if it's abuse, if it's whatever, even if it's infidelity, it's now two people, the same team. They're not responsible. You can't blame somebody for something in a marriage. Mm, you cannot. So you do, good. but you cannot. If you're already married and you've already done this, please go back and apologize to your spouse because you were wrong. It's 50% everything. So... You're a team. Wow. You win or lose together. That's... There is no other way around it. Wow. If someone cheats, yes, they have an issue in their heart or their head that needs to be dealt with, but it also means their home wasn't a safe enough place to talk about it, and their spouse, you, were not safe enough to deal with it together. It is There is 50%. Brings a whole new meaning to who's responsible for divorce. Mm. That's interesting too, because like biblically, people you know will take a pass um, on divorce, or they're given a pass if there's any type of violence, or if there's any type of um, infidelity. And infidelity means something different to everyone. You know, so when Brad and I walked through that season of um, our our marriage at the very beginning, um, you know, I looked for really, really wise counsel. I looked for somebody who was going to be objective and had the best possible results that I could think of. And that person, like, straight up verbatim told me, like, if you walked out in your marriage right now, nobody would blame you. That is totally your choice, you know, um... But I knew that it was bigger than that. I couldn't just point the finger and be like, he did this. It's his fault. I'm out of here, man. Um, because just as Brad said, like, I think that people can be provoked. I think that you can, you can, you can take a step back from a situation. You can ask for wise counsel and you can find out is the partner committed to a course correction in their life? So, you know, if your partner is violent, I would not say, like, yeah, definitely just stay and see if you get beat to death. Like, that's not what I'm saying at all. But if your partner is committed to a course correction in their life, and you guys can objectively look at the whole thing together and get help and get counseling, I don't believe that, like, just because one person, you know, you had a heated argument and your spouse shoved you, like, yeah, you get a pass, you could walk out, you could leave, you get a divorce. But just like Brad said, like, it takes two to tango. Like, what? Look at it and be like, okay, was this a two-person deal? Was this a two-person action? Was this a two-person mistake? Um, because I don't think that 100% of the time divorce is the answer. So, uh, yeah, let's just balance that out and say if you're with someone who's uh, a sexual addict and they're cheating on you left and right and they don't see anything wrong with it and they just keep doing it for years and years and years and years I am so not saying that you have to stay with that um, but you know if you're in a in a partnership and in, in a marriage where you guys are both committed to choose each other um, I think that you can objectively look back and say okay if my spouse stepped out on the marriage um, and there was infidelity like did I do something that provoked that? Did I contribute in any way, shape, or form? Because um, chances are, yeah, you might have. So be honest with yourself. I had to. It sucked.
Did I die? No. Is our marriage better? What do you think? Yes. Sweet. Cool. All right. I don't have any more notes, so unless someone's got a question, I think we're about good. So in summary, if you get married, uh, change your last name, become a team, wear their jersey, yeah. get on the same side so that when they see out of the side of their eye, they see that they have got you as their teammate and you're not wearing a different color jersey mm -hmm. and on the other team. Um, and the other thing, commingle your finances, get on the same page, get on the same team and make it difficult to unravel a marriage. It should not be so easy as grabbing a divorce attorney and waiting 90 days. You should have a lot more hoops to jump through because that is a commitment level. It takes something to unravel. Awesome. It shouldn't be easy. So if you haven't, you need to go watch the first four sessions, please, please because this you. one has got a whole bunch of stuff in it that won't make a ton of sense unless you have. So... But it's been amazing. Yeah. It's been amazing to be able to talk to y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you so You bless us so much just by listening. It's so cool. And, um, yeah, if, I don't know when we'll do another one, but we probably will for sure. Um, if you got questions, put them in the comments or send us a private message. We would love to answer your questions once again. If you're a guy, don't PM Ixtina. If you're a girl, don't PM me, but include us both in the PM. That is the way we protect each other and ourselves. Um, you know, we've been through some pretty hard stuff, with, uh, especially with me, making some poor choices. And we don't want to go through that again, so we set up boundaries to protect ourselves because we're on the same team. We're on the same team. What color jersey do we have, baby? I just know I noticed you out of the corner of my eye. Oh, that's good stuff. All right, y'all. Have a wonderful evening, and we will talk to you soon. Please, I'm going to see a whole bunch of you in... Orlando! A week and a half. Yeah. Almost just more than a week. And uh, I would love for you to come Get let us, us know. Give us a squinch. Come let us know how these affected you. Yeah. We would love to hear it. Yeah. We will talk to you soon. Okay.